people are protesting uh, the getting murdered down in the street. Our boys, I mean, they just shot the, the boy, uh, Tamir Rice. 12 year old. Now, I saw the video now. It was a drive by shoot. I don't even think the cop got out the car. I didn't see him. Police say Tamir was told three times to raise his hands, but his family questions the speed of the incident. It is our belief that this situation could have been avoided and that Tamir should still be here with us. I seen the cop roll up and in three seconds that boy was on the ground dying. In three seconds. Like he was just waiting to get there. Oh, nigga with a gun, I'm, I gotta get there first. 12 year old boy. If that ain't bad enough, you already know about the young man shot inside the store of, of Walmart. Inside Walmart with a BB gun. Police come in hunting him down like he's Rambo. Uh, if you watch the video, ducking around corners and stuff, coming in, just hunting him down. But the 12 year old boy, that, that, that got to my heart because it's like that, look about his size, his age. You know, uh, about the same size, his age. You know, so, but it's not going to stop. It's not going to stop because our people, and I, I put, you know, I'm going to pull up something from my, uh, from my Facebook because I put this on the wall and this would be a good opportunity to elaborate on it. And then I'm going to share something else that was there. And uh, what I put up there was, the question is not, uh, is not, what, the question is not whether we are victims or not. The question is whether we are willing victims. Removing willingness makes it harder to be victimized. By proclaiming your nationality and rejecting the labels such as Negro, Black, and Colored, you begin to remove that willingness legally. You see? I love the way you See, our people, they, they, they have the... And I want to say this because I don't want our people, our people that hear us, they say that we're Moors and they say, well, we're black and we're so against black, they think that we're against them. Right. We're the same people. Right. We just put so-called in front of it. We so-called black. Right. We're talking about the same thing. But the, the difference is we have a knowledge that our people as a whole have not come to yet. Right. Uh, because of us focusing on nationhood, that is, is, is paramount for the issue today. So our people have it in there, and I'm, I'm going to keep reading it, and it says, there are many ways a person can be willing to their own victimization legally, even though they may be unwilling in their heart, in their spirit, and in their mind. Mm. That's what you see out there. You see protests. The Ferguson flashpoint had a ripple effect in many American communities overnight and throughout today. Coast to coast, uh, thousands of people took to the streets and the sidewalks to march and voice their opinions about that decision. Right. Because it's in their heart and their spirit and it's in their mind, but they don't have the knowledge of how to fight legally. Uh, so I'm not, so I'm going to keep going. It says, uh, it says, we must begin to protest against the status as a whole. But many of our prominent so-called black leaders will not even touch on the issue. They allow the energy of your spirit to go unchanneled into meaningful political social change. Is it not obvious that everyone else enjoys a status that so-called blacks have fully yet to recognize in this country? What else can explain the nonchalant dismissal of our grievances and the denial of basic human rights even in regards to the murder of our children without due process and protection under the law. It's not the law, it's not that the laws don't apply, it's that they are applied quite differently. Hmm. Until we get to the root cause as to why, we will protest between now and eternity and never see the problem solved. Protest by all means, but keep the root cause in mind. Inferior status leads to inferior treatment. And keep that in mind alongside of each individual protest. So what we do, Tam Tamar Tamir Rice gets murdered. Mike Brown gets murdered. Oscar Grant gets murdered. We protest each of these individually. And then you have, Rev uh, not, I'm not even going to call him, honor him with Reverend, but Al Sharpton and Jesse and everybody else who comes down. And they play on the spirit and emotion of the people and they get them riled up and they get them riled up until all their energy fizzles out into the universe. Justice! Justice! What do we want? 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 Justice! When do we want it? Justice! When do we want it? Yeah! And no meaningful 
political change comes of it. Because our people are protesting the treatment. The treatment. But they're not protesting the cause of the treatment. Mm -hmm. Protest the treatment. But protest the cause of the treatment. Inferior treatment is a result of inferior status. And this is the key that they have to understand. Nobody wants to address why they're, but why are you being treated like this? Because you have an inferior status. And now can't nobody tell me that so-called black, pe black people don't have an inferior status when they're the only ones that have to have their voting rights renewed every 25 years. Coming up next in 2031. My fellow Americans, I am about to sign into law the Civil Rights Act of 1964. I want to take this occasion to talk to you about what that law means to every American. My fellow citizens, we have come now to a time of testing. We must not fail. Let us close the springs of racial poison. Let us pray for wise and understanding hearts. Let us lay aside irrelevant differences and make our nation whole. We're still here. Images of Demi Ferguson, this looking like 1968. I'm like, why are these things looking the same? History repeating itself. Period. What are we going to do next? How are, you going, how are we going to change laws around here? How are we going to stop police brutality? Swim from Europe over here illegally. When you become a citizen and finally uh, uh, take on citizenship, you can vote to the day you die. Your children can be born and vote to the day they die and be American citizens, even if they're born outside the country. And they can vote to the day they die. So answer me this. Who else do you know in the United States that got temporary voting rights? So if you don't have permanent voting rights, then that means you got a temporary status. That temporary status, I mean, uh, temp uh, temporary status, that temporary status, that inferior status is a result, the treatment is a result of that. Now I'm gonna read something to you. This comes from uh, this is a screenshot. It comes from um, I was doing some research yesterday, and I came across this wonderful book. <laughs> it's called uh, Dred Scott. Let me see. It's called Dred Scott. The Dred Scott decision. Opinion of Chief Justice Tanny. All right. So, and it's from 1863. So this is coming not something now that people are interpreting Dred right. Scott now. This is coming from, and that's why I wanted to hook this up here so I could Dang. put it up here. But next time we'll do it. It says, now this is in the introduction. It's not even, doesn't even get to, uh, to uh, Tani's, uh, let me make sure I'm at the right spot. That's the Supreme Court Justice. Uh, yes, yes. So I want to get to the first one. I have a few. All right, so this says, let's get down to it. All right, it says, whatever the course or legislation of sovereign states henceforth forever, the status of the Negro his relation to white citizens and the rights of the latter in respect to slave property are now clearly defined within federal jurisdiction. And this is an immunities guaranteed to citizens do not apply to them. Not being citizen within the meaning of the Constitution, they are not entitled to suit in court. So, this this has never been changed. Never. This ruling has not been changed. All right? So you get to the 13th and the 14th Amendment, and, uh, and, then you, and so they tell you that, well, now these things make you citizen, where if you read it carefully, the only thing it does is put you in their jurisdiction. That's it. Puts you under their jurisdiction, and it exchanges privileges for rights. It exchanges, it, it tweaks the definition of citizen to include you. But <laughs> to include your status, but it is not changing your status. And that's why the so-called white Southerners was fighting against it. 
No, Negro is a slave. Because you know how they know the Negro is a slave? Because they made the Negro. We didn't come over here, Negroes. Right. We didn't come over here, black. No. We didn't come over here, colored. And in fact, colored didn't even apply to so-called black people. First, it applied to Native Americans. The way they defrauded my great, 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 great grandmother and a lot of others by putting person of color instead of the tribe or the Indian. If you go back and hit, if you go back far enough, you check out the census from say 1700 on down, the uh, classifications in the census, you'll see the change. It's right there for you to see. You'll see the reclassification. So what did they do? They reclassified you all kind of different ways to put you in this status that they have tweaked to uh, include you in the Constitution that was not designed to include you. <laughs> and so that's why you have so-called white people fighting over whether or not Black people are citizens because technically, no, you're not. Now, um, this is important because it brings, it goes back to the status because because of this status that you're in, you receive inferior treatment. See, the judge ruled that because the Constitution did not include him, that the rights uh, it didn't apply to him. It didn't apply. So, so when when uh, a citizen calls the police, when they pull up, they already know you're not a citizen because they know what status they put you in. You could be the one calling the police. <laughs> They're going to come up to you first. <laughs> They're going to come up to you first. Yep. They're going to put you in the handcuffs, put you in the car. You might end up dead before they find out that you're the one to call the police. And then they might not even care. You still might end up, if not dead, locked up for something, resisting arrest, because you're trying to tell them that you're the one that called them. You see? They know the status that you're in. So now, uh, check out Pete King. Uh, go ahead, Islam. Islam, um, at the end of the meeting, there was um, some uh, activity going on right here. Uh -huh. uh, the two police officers, they put over, uh, you know, Hispanic... Um, Passengers in a car, mm -hmm. and they, I guess they had a warrant. They searched. He admitted to having contraband or whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. Third demonstration. Mm -hmm. And you know, as I was, I was hearing as I was walking by. So, Moors are, uh, you know, we walk with prestige. Moors are prestige. So I walk as I am right now, mm -hmm. and the police, they had to, they stopped what they were doing, got off the sidewalk until I passed by, mm -hmm. and one officer said, how you doing? Mm -hmm. Like, waiting for me to acknowledge him. And then when I um, passed through, they resumed what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it goes back to what we were talking about, creed. Creed, yeah. See? You in costume. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or should I say you practicing your custom. Mm -hmm. So when they see you practicing your customs and your natural self, there's going to be an a, a, a innate reaction in them. Whether they know it or not. They're going to tell themselves, this is not a Negro. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> right. I better be careful the way I deal with this one because he may not be what I think he is based on color, right? But when you change, you know, when you put it, come in your proper persona and practice your customs, then they're going to deal with you differently. But not all the time. And we must be careful that we say that. There is such a thing as threat, duress, and coercion, and they do choose to use that. And that emanates from the papal bull passed by uh, Pope Nikolai V, that Moors and Saracens. Now, now keep in mind, he passed this, I believe, in 1452, one year before 1453 Byzantine, when we sat Constantinople. He, he gave this bull because he could foresee that the Moors and the Moors Turks were going to be able to, to uh, overrun him. So what he did was, he said that, uh, I believe it was King Alfonso and... Uh, uh, King Alfonso had wrote him about the Moors and the Saracens, and he responded back that Moors and Saracens could be, uh, were, were open game to be uh, uh, 
saved from their heathen ways and be forced into the religion of Christianity and they didn't have to respect their lands and they didn't have to respect their rights and any of that stuff. Now this is what happened, uh, uh, this was before 1491, before the last stronghold in Granada had fell. So they know what they're moving under. When you look at them, we call them Romans. We don't call them pigs. We call them Romans because they're Romans. They got Roman seals. They got Roman uniform and they got Roman structure that they got from the Nubians, Moles, that they got from Egypt, you know. So, I bring this up to say that uh, and I'm going I'm to shift gears for a second here because we have these holidays coming up. We just passed Thanksgiving. If anybody was watching the Thanksgiving for whom and stuff like that, you know, you know that that's the beginning of slavery, right there. Um, actually, the, the, the Papal Bull of Pope Nikolai, 1452, that's the beginning. Because now, they, could, uh, they didn't have to respect your creed. All right, They disregard that creed. They only respect Roman, European, white supremacy, Christianity. That's all synonymous. That's all uh, free white Christian, that's all synonymous. Alright? I'm not talking about a follower of Christ. But before we learn of this slavery that we supposedly come from, we were Moors. And our fall in Spain was the beginning of the perpetual slavery. That's another thing Pope Nicolai said. Perpetual mm -hmm. slavery. That means forever. Yep. So if he said forever, you think they do you think they didn't had enough yet? They not stop, they haven't stopped. They, they still following that. Only they have tricked, not just you, but they refined it on you first because now they got everybody in, 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 a, in a corporate uh, slave status. Mm -hmm. But you're in a special corporate slave status. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Yours is still what everyone else have. You still missing some stuff. Just like that voting rights we was talking about. You're still missing some stuff. But that's what Noble Jew Ali came to give us. That's what we have and that's what we have to start living by and that's what we have to get our people to understand. You can protest against the treatment all day long but if you don't address the status. Now I heard Melissa Perry on more TV. I don't know if you guys saw that and he, he put a clip of Melissa Perry. Man she, I, I fell in love with her and I'm talking about just her spirit you know because she brought up the Dred Scott case. She brought up three-fifths of a human being. If you haven't seen it, she sound like uh, she oh, sound like the last poets or Mir Baraka. The whole what? thing. If you just put some kungas behind it or something, <laughs> I'm telling you, she was blowing, she was blowing the Morris line. Mm. She was blowing the Morris line, and at the end, she ended it with three-fifths of a human being. Three-fifths of a human being. Three-fifths of a human being, just like that. You know that's last points. Yeah. Three fifths of a human being. You mean to tell me all our so-called black leaders don't know this? Hmm. You mean Reverend Al Sharpton don't know about three fifths of a human being? Hmm. Don't none of these people, Jesse Jackson, don't know about three fifths of a human being? Hmm. They know about it, but why won't nobody mention? Because they not all. They can't. Cause master won't let them. Yep. And the reason they running around with fezzes and all of that stuff, until so-called black people, I'm talking about the Shriners now, realize that they are the secret, they're never going to get nowhere. Nah. Even Stilly Dan tell you, you're never going to do it without the fez on. His people keep giving you clues, keep giving you clues, but we're not listening. So imagine if you get cut, you get stabbed, and I'm going to close with this. Imagine you get stabbed right here, right? You bleeding profusely. And somebody run up to you and put a band-aid on. Hmm. Right? Let's say it caught up a little bit and stopped bleeding, but it has a band-aid on it. It ain't really covered right or washed right. What's gonna happen? Infection. You're gonna get an infection. The problem gonna get worse and worse and worse, and it can possibly kill you. Mm -hmm. And that's what it amounts to when we protest individual Issue. issues, mm -hmm. you know, and the treatment and not the status. But it's coming to the forefront, and make no mistake about it, it's the Moors that's in the vanguard of it. It's long. We've been, we've been pushing this line from the very beginning. It's and our long. brothers and sisters have to understand us, uh, that we so-called black, 
But we are awake. We, everything that you do in self-determination, all of that, you can still do it. But uh, black power. I'm a mo, and I'm down with black power. That sounds like a contradiction, huh? Mm -mm. Because black power is a political philosophy. It does not address identity. We got to stop playing around. It don't address identity. Nope. But you tell me that you're not for self-determination. You read the 10-point platform of the Black Panther Party and tell me that you don't want your people to know the truth, their true role in this present-day decadent American society and have the true history and education about themselves. And I'm paraphrasing. It's been a long time I quoted that one. But you, they, you know, anyone who knows the 10-point platform know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Basically, self-determination, that's all the Panthers was talking about. Self-determination, freedom of political prisoners, all that kind of stuff. I'm with all that. Now, Black Power was coined by Kwame Ture, uh, formerly Stokely Carmichael. Keep in mind, brothers and sisters, it's political philosophy. We want black people to be empowered because blacks in the status that they're in are never going to be empowered. We want them to be empowered as black people. And when they become empowered, the way that they're going to get empowered is by nationalizing right. and leaving that black caste label that they have been under all this time. And there's no other way up out of this for them. There's no other way out of this for us. Right. It's no other way. Because uh, from the time Noble Ju Ali came, 1913 AD, said it'd be 50 years before the people understood what he had. Did he not? Mm -hmm. yes, According he did. to the All Statements and yes, Prophecies, yes, that bring us right smack dab into the 1960s where the question of so-called black people had intensified to the point of how it is today with riots in the street. And once again, it was usurped by the Civil Rights Bill and some Uncle Tom Negroes giving us a damn temporary stack. Yep. Just like the Freedmen's Bureau did back in the day. And now Negroes are going to do the same damn thing again behind Mike Brown. Justice is the calling. We witnessing the rise of the fallen.